Welcome to the International Sunday School lesson for Sunday, November 7th, 2021. The title of this lesson and Boyd's commentary, as well as Towson's Press International Sunday School commentary is, All People Praise God. Hey, if you enjoy our lessons, please let us know by liking, commenting, subscribing, and hitting the little bell to be notified when we post each week. To find out more about Jordan Christian Center, a virtual ministry aiming to transform lives by equipping, educating, empowering, as well as encouraging the world, please visit us at jordanchristiancenter.com. Hey, I'm Minister Adam, and Sunday School is now in session. Now, before we get into our lesson, let's start with a moment of prayer. Father, we just ask that you be with us as we go through your word, Lord. Lord, we praise you, we honor you, not only for all that you've already done, Lord, but for giving us an opportunity to spend all eternity with you and worship you forever. We love you, honor, and praise you. And it's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's get into our lesson. Now our scripture will be coming from Revelations chapter seven, verses nine through 17. And the main thought will be Revelation chapter seven, verse 14, which says, and he said unto him, sir, are you the one who knows? Then he said to me, these are the ones who died in the great tribulation. They have washed their robes in the blood of the lamb and made them white. And the aim of our lesson today is by the end of this lesson, we will understand how God's salvation and justice for all people inspires praise and worship. Embrace the significance of praising God in unity and respond to God's love with goodness and grace and joy and exaltation. Now, as we do each week, we'll start off with a little bit of background. We're now in lesson 10 of our fall quarter and the beginning a new unit that's titled Visions of praise. Now, this week's lesson is coming out of the book of Revelations. Now, Revelations was written by the Apostle John. We know this because in Revelation chapter 1 verse 4, he mentioned that this is the Apostle John. And this is not to be confused with John the Baptist. See, Apostle John, he also, he wrote a total of five books in the New Testament, including the Gospel of John, where he talks about the life of Jesus, as well as John 1, 2, and 3, along with the book we're in today, Revelations. The book of Revelations was written for all believers, but especially for the believers in the seven churches addressed in chapter two and three of the book. These churches were located in modern day Turkey, consisting largely of Gentile believers meeting in church homes, and they faced significant persecution. Now, each church was given specific information in addition to the overall vision shared by all believers. John wrote this book while he was banished to the island of Patmos as a punishment for his Christian faith. Because he went around talking about Christ, um, the Roman Empire banished him to this particular island. There, he had revelations about end times, and he wrote the book of Revelations. Now, the Re book of Revelation is both a warning to Christians who have grown dispirited, as well as to encourage those who kept the faith during the struggles of this world. The chapter begins with 100 and, the 144,000, which is 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, marked with the seal of the Lord. But then the gathering that John spoke about after the first portion of the book, um, it was an uncountable number of people as they began to praise God in front of his throne. And this is where our lesson picks up today in Revelations chapter 7, verse 9 and 10, which says, After I saw a vast crowd, too many to count, from each nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hand. And they shouted out with great roar, Salvation comes from the Lord who sits on the throne from the Lamb. These verses fast forward to the end of tribulations and the struggles of life. The 144 Jews um, have faithfully evangelized to the world 
uh, about Christ and the innumerable amount of Gentiles that have trusted in Christ to be their salvation. They represented every nation, every tribe, every group of people, uh, regardless of language and background. See, this is a very powerful and emotional reminder that all people are precious in the sight of God, no matter the race, um, ethnicity, or background. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. The only thing about it is we have to believe that Jesus is the son of God and he died on the cross for our sins. See, unlike us, see, we like to separate ourselves among different groups from whether it's races or teams and cities and countries, um, dialogues, cultures, even denominations and political parties. But the great multitude that's mentioned here in verse nine is united. It shows us that only God alone have the ability to unite an entire human race, an entire human fam as one family, all pointing towards him and praising him. The message of the gospel is inherently opposite to any type of racism or any type of ethnic um, hatred. So anyone that participate in these particular things cannot be of God because it shows us here that God has the multitude praising him, not because they look alike, but because they all worship Christ. They all believed Christ during this time. We as the body of Christ are identified strictly by our affiliation and our relationship with Christ. The multitude here is also united in their entire attire in which they are described as wearing white robes and they have palm branches in their hand. So the white robe, we know uh, white represents purity and victory. And the palms, they denote, uh, you find in ancient times, these were tools of celebrations. Something like if we were talking about modern days, it's like we would have uh, confetti or fireworks. Well, they had palms. And the picture that um, John paints for us is that there's still more to come. There's still more that's going to give their life to Christ. The number is not yet complete. Also, the inclusion of the number is not based on our own efforts. Only God know who will be in that number, and he alone is the righteous judge. So we don't know how many, but God does. God know every single one that's listed in that multitude by name because each of them have to have a relationship with him. Now, when we talk about the palms that were in their hand, notice they didn't come empty handed. They had palms in their hand. Now, palms has been uh, is to celebrate the victory that we had. they had in God. Similarly, when Jesus came into Jerusalem the week before he was crucified, it said he came on a donkey and the believers waited on each side of the road. They cheered and they laid the streets with palms and they had it in their hand to celebrate the arrival of the king. This is the same type of depiction we find here in Revelations. But here's the thing. The multitude, they weren't silent. They shouted out with praise to God and they worshiped God as he sat on the throne with the lamb. This actually shows us we don't have to wait to that time. We can praise God right now. When we come into the house of God, we can have celebration in our heart. We can sing, we can shout, we can dance all to praise our Lord right now. This is more like a, 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 a practice of what we'll do on that fateful day when Christ returns. They said salvation belonged to God. In other words, victory belonged to God. Salvation and victory is, is, is a God thing. Saving is the business of God. That's what God do. He saves us when we believe in his son. God saves us from the wrath of sin, from our situation. Even in times, he saves us from ourselves. We don't earn salvation. It is freely given to all that accepts it. Now, in the latter part of this verse, it also add the lamb to the picture. Salvation belonged to God who sits on the throne and from the lamb. Well, we know the lamb is Jesus. Jesus is the lamb that made it possible for us to be able to accept God or moreover, for God to be able to accept us because God can accept, accept anything unholy. God separates himself from sin, but Jesus dying on the cross um, it forgive, it allows us to be forgiven our sin and he bridges that gap between us and God as a living sacrifice or the lamb of God, the sacrificial lamb. So it was the blood of the lamb that purifies us and saves us from eternal death. So the multitude shouted out in praise and worship to the sovereign God who sits on the eternal throne through 
the blood of his son, Jesus, all who had welcomed Jesus into their life and believed in him, they were actually able to enter his presence. That sounds like such a great, wonderful time as we would have an opportunity to see God face to face. Now, as we move down to verses uh, 11 and 12, it says, and all the angels standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell before the throne with their faces on the ground and worship God. They sang, amen, blessings and glory and wisdom and thankfulness and honor and power and strength belong to God forever and ever Amen. So as a multitude praised God, we found that the angels begin to praise God and the elders and the four living creatures begin to join in the praise and, and praising God, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It shows us that praise is sometimes uh, contagious. Even today, when someone begins to shout praises and hallelujah to God in the house of God, it's hard not to join in. It's contagious. But here we find that when the multitude began to sing praises, to God, we find that the angels begin to join in and they fell to the ground and lay prostrate before God in an acknowledgement to God and the Lamb who provides salvation to all who believed in Him. And it, it prompted them all to begin to praise and worship God. See, worship is a correct response to the sovereignty of God and His saving grace. God led the wise man to the place where Jesus was. And what did they do when they found Jesus? They fell down and praised the baby Christ. When Jesus healed the blind man, the blind man fell down and worshiped Christ. We find in Psalms um, 95, 6, it says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Even further on in Psalms 99, 5, it says, Exalt the Lord our God, worship him at his footstool. Holy is he. So we find here the angels begin to praise with an amen, and they actually end with the amen. Amen means so let it be. So they start with amen because the multitude said praise to God for salvation, and salvation belonged to God, and they said so let it be. Then they fell down and praised God, and after they finished, they said so let it be. One, two, three. Now, in verse 12, the angels are praising God, and they're listing the seven attributes of God that they're praising. Now, one of the things you'll find in the book of Revelations is the number seven used quite often. Seven is the number of completion, and God is a complete God. Now we find first they said for his blessings. God is the source of every blessing and every good deed in our life. Next was glory. Now glory is in reference to his splendor and his brilliance. As a matter of fact, saints, it's impossible to be truly happy without God in your life. They're praising him for his wisdom, for his all knowing. There's no beginning or end to God. He knows everything because he created everything. Isaiah said that there's no searching his understanding. They're praising him in thanksgiving. There, there's, he's worthy of all the praise and they're thanking him for all that he's done. They're giving him honor. So we praise God to, to honor him and recognize his value, which we know he is invaluable. There's no measuring um, the value of God. They're praising him for his power. The word power is derived from a Hebrew word meaning dudamus, which in English we would say dynamite. Uh, the power, think of the power of a dynamite there. We can't even measure God's power. So if we were to think of uh, as dynamite, as the explosion of this little package of dynamite. As a matter of fact, Isaiah said, who can compare to God? He is like no other. He has all power and authority in his hand. And then lastly, they talked about God's strength. Now, God's strength, they're praising him for his might. Might is the, meaning that he has the ability and the strength and the authority to do all that he needs to do. Now, is an infinite attributes when it comes to God, if you try to list out that all God is. However, the seven attributes that they mentioned, they said God, they will last forever and ever. They're infinite. God will always bless. God will always get the glory, the honor, the praise. He will always have the power and authority. So we need to have this high view of God because it truly reflects who God is. 
Now, as we move down to verses 13 and 14, it says, Then one of the 24 elders asked me, Who are those who are clothed in white? Where do they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you are the one who knows. Then he said to me, Those are the ones who died in the great tribulation. They have washed their robes in the blood of the lamb and made them white. See, in this verse, we find that one of the elders in heaven asked the apostle John the identity of the multitude, the innumerable multitude that John was talking about. The elder then referred to their white robes and he um, asked specifically, where did they come from? See, this is yet another example or spiritual example of a figure um, asking a question when in fact they already knew what the answer was. The question being asked was, it's for an effect. It was, it was to prompt a response, not because they were speaking uh, or the speaker in this case um, was not informed. He knew exactly what it was. And John said, you know who it is. See, it seemed that the elder who asked John about the white robe um, multitude of believers there wanted him to focus on them as the overcomers. And therefore he's encouraging John who is enduring trials and tribulation as he's been banded, uh, um, uh, banished to this Allen here. So the elder is saying, who are those? He know who they are. And then he tell John, these are the ones who overcame all that the world had to offer them, and they still stuck with the Lord. Now they're being recognized and able to praise God in front of the throne. See, we can't forget, again, that John is suffering while he's um, receiving this revelation. John and many of the other believers uh, during that time, they were suffering persecution there in the first century, but God assured them back then and us right now through other writers like Paul that they were the conquerors through, G they're, as a matter of fact, they're more than conquerors through Jesus. Not even death could separate them from the love of God. Also, we find in the second letter to Timothy, Paul said that those who endure will reign with Christ. Even John himself is encouraging the readers. He said, he who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. Sometimes we just need some encouragement in our life. And if nothing else can encourage you today, to know that as long as you believe that Jesus died on the cross for God, that's enough encouragement because regardless of what we have to deal with here on earth, when we leave this body, when we are one with God, there's no more crying, no more suffering, no more pain. And this is what John is describing here in Revelations chapter 7. So even when John had been, uh, we, we find here that even when John had been with Christ for three years as Christ walked the earth, he didn't know everything because when the elder asked him the question, he said, you know who they are. John didn't know who they were. So we find he didn't know everything. Likewise, believe it today, we don't know everything either. However, we find in Luke 12, 48, we are accountable for what we do know. There's no searching God's understanding. We will never, while we walk this earth, know all that God has in store for us. But as we read his word and we're convicted by the Holy Spirit, we are accountable for what we do know. So the elders informed John that the multitude are the ones who stayed the course even in the worst of time. Now to put it in context, let's look at what Paul said in 2 Corinthians um, chapter 4, verses 89. In other words, the multitude were the ones that was pressed on every side by troubles, but they weren't crushed. They were the ones that were perplexed, but were not driven to despairs. They were the ones that were hunted down, but never abandoned by God. They were knocked down, but they were never destroyed. They fought the good fight, and now they get to stand before God at the throne. So here it is a, th this vision is so inspirational in that we know that if we fight the good fight and we keep the faith, we will be a part of the multitude regardless of our past or our race or our height or our weight, our culture, geographic location. We will be in that multitude as well if we keep the faith. As long as we believe that Christ is the son of God, the ultimate faith sacrifice for our sins, we will be one of the number um, the, of the multitude that will be praising God with the palm trees in our hand, shouting hallelujah, salvation belong to God who sits upon his throne forever and ever. 
See, the elder, he then mentioned that the multitude were white because they were washed in the blood of Jesus or the blood of the lamb who we know is Jesus. Look, some people wonder how a brown cow could eat green grass and produce white milk. Well, that mystery is nothing compared to how us as, sin uh, as filthy sinners can be washed in the blood of the lamb and come out as white as snow. This happens because only God can remove the stain of sin in our life. See, it, it's interesting how when we look at sin and we look at sin as a color, um, we often equate that color to be black. And that's not the case. The, the color of sin mentioned in the Bible is more of a crimson color. So we find that the only way to remove the stain of the blood of the crimson color is for it to be washed away through the blood of Jesus. What could wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We find here in our final verses of this lesson, verses 15 through 17, which says, this is why they stand in front of God's throne and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will give them shelter. They will never again be hungry or thirsty. They should never be scorched by the sun, the heat of the sun. For the lamb on the throne will be their shepherd and he will lead them to springs of life-giving water and God will wipe away every tear from their eye. So we find here that the elders continue to say that they have positioned themselves before God's throne and they are privileged to serve God continuously. See, serving God is, is not something that's tiring or boring task for the um, tribulation uh, survivors there. No, it, it shouldn't be for us either. We should be able to serve God with gladness. See, the, the, the tribulation survivors here, they serve God day and night. The joy of being able to walk around heaven all day praising God as he shelters them. See, God is said to shelter them with his presence. He will spread his tabernacle over them as he did when the, the Israelites journeyed from the desert on the way to the promised land. The tabernacle was the place that God met his people and um, it, the tabernacle was portable, which means that wherever the Jews went or the Israelites went, God was right there in their presence. Similarly, the presence of God will be with the survivors of the tribulations for all times, wherever they go, as we worship God and be in the presence of God forever and ever. If we would look at Matthew 24, Jesus had described the time before his coming to earth to reign. He said that there will be times of famine, of religious deceptions, international warfare, um, there will be afflictions and death, there will be global catastrophes, and there will be persecution. Consequently, many believers will be executed and many will go hungry and be thirsty. Furthermore, God's judgment during the tribulation will also include in extreme environmental effects on all inhabitants of the earth. Then we find in Revelation um, 8, 7, it mentioned that there will be hell and fire, a mixture of blood that will be burned up, um, or that would actually burn up one third of the earth and all of the vegetation for one third of the earth. It will be extremely hard to survive those difficult days of the end. Nevertheless, when the believers enter the presence of God, as we find here in Revelations, when they enter his presence, they shall hunger no more, neither shall they thirst anymore, and they will no longer experience the scorching sun or any other effects of the raptures because now they are in the presence of God. Verse 17 says that he will lead them to the living water. So when we, we find that when Jesus met the Samaritan woman uh, at the Jacob's web, he said to her that he would be able to give her living water. And what it meant, he will give her spiritual water that will quench her thirst and give her life. And we find here that the multitude uh, who are at the throne of God, they're going to receive the eternal water from God, who's being depicted here as their shepherd. Now, perhaps at that moment, they can truly understand what David was meant in Psalms 23 when he said, the Lord is my shepherd. 
I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He lead me beside the still water. He restored my soul. He leadeth me on the path of righteousness for his namesake. We find when Jesus returned, the believers were never thirst again. They will never be hungry. But after all of their struggles on earth, after the battle is over, after they've cried and they fought, yet they kept the faith, God will wipe away their tears and they will never have to share another one. And this is the part that, that could have several different interpretations of it. But I, I believe that at one point, those believers may be crying because they finally met God. They may be crying because of the loved ones that may not have made it to that point whatever reason they were crying it says god will wipe away them that means there won't be any more sadness no grief or anything like that we would just be able to worship with god picture a parent tenderly wiping away the tears of a child that they rescued that's what god would do for us at that time when we meet him at his throne he will wipe away every tear so in conclusion, if you need encouragement today or you just need to, to know what's going to happen in that time when we meet God, this lesson leave us in awe of those days to come. We too should be included in that number as believers. We'd be able to stand before the eternal royal throne of God. We will be privileged to stand as one of those uh, who are once unworthy to even be called um, a Christian at all, but we'll be able to stand before God and he will actually know our name. To John, it was the multitude. To the elder, it might have been a multitude, but God know each and every one of our name because we belong to him. Therefore, victory belong to God. And since we belong to God, victory also belong to us. Children of God, even though we have to go through struggles here on earth, it's a fixed fight. And we've already won in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, that concludes our lesson for this week. Don't forget to give us a like or comment or even subscribe to our channel. So until next week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn towards you and give you peace. Goodbye and you have a blessed week.